In today's video, I'm going to share a little bit about my story and I have my partner Ryan here who's going to sort of ask some questions and uh, really dig into uh, just a little bit about you know how I got into real estate, why I got into real estate and just the different steps in my journey so far. Awesome. Well, let's get into it, Koken. Uh, we, last week, we kind of did this the opposite way where you interviewing me. So I'm really excited to uh, interview you here a little bit. Why don't we kind of start with like going way back? Like uh, you're obviously an immigrant to Canada, kind of probably had a big influence on, you know, your real estate life. Why don't we kind of go back to the beginning, at least uh, when you came here and how that kind of maybe has influenced you to get into the real estate world? Sure. Yeah. So I, uh, I was born in Sri Lanka. Uh, my dad's Sri Lankan. My mom's Japanese. Grew up there until I was 12, and then our family moved uh, to Canada. Yeah, so uh, what was that like? You, you know, like let's dig into that a little bit. <laughs> I, I, you know, maybe some people that are, we, they're also you know immigrants, and obviously there's people like myself who aren't. Uh, what was that kind of like like for you as a kid? Yeah, moving to Canada was it's hard to describe, but uh, it's definitely different. Like mm. we didn't have winters <laughs> in Sri Lanka. It's snow. It's a tropical <laughs> country, but even just culturally, right? Like. It's funny to look back now, but when I came to Canada, English was my only language. Okay. And I couldn't understand the way that Canadians spoke English. Like, you, like my first impression was that Canadians speak English too quickly for me to understand it. Because in Sri Lanka, people spoke English as a second language and just there was a different tone to their voice, right? For sure. So yeah, that was, that was tough in the first, like a couple of months, I was like, what are, what are people saying? Like, and yeah. So anyway, different challenges. I, I came to middle school here. So I went to like grade eight, spent a couple of years getting accustomed to the culture, mannerisms, just yeah, getting used to everything. And part of how that influenced sort of the trajectory of my career and my life so far has been when we lived in Sri Lanka, uh, let me preface this, my dad, Prior to my family moving to Sri Lanka, they actually lived in Japan for a couple of years. Okay. And uh, my dad worked for about three years, saved up, I believe, thirty thousand dollars back then, and that funded about you know ten to fifteen years of us living in Sri Lanka. So, like, money goes a long way. Wow. Right. And we were we never owned a property in Sri Lanka, but we were renting homes that were like nice homes relatively nice and so like the last place we lived in was a duplex where we lived in the upper level and it had like five bedrooms all right so it was like this spacious upper level we went to like the quote-unquote international schools where they taught in english you had to pay an amount of money that here would be insignificant but to the locals it was literally like a year's salary to send someone to this school so like if you were a, just a normal person working in Sri Lanka you couldn't afford it right right so <clears throat> in a way we were like upper middle class in Sri Lanka then we moved to Canada we're living in this two-bedroom apartment my dad's working minimum wage my mom same number of people that you had in the five bedroom yeah, apartment yeah. Okay. okay so it's like <laughs> our parents and me and my two siblings the yeah. five of us are living in a two-bedroom apartment and it's just a, a regular apartment now in Toronto that same apartment would be a lot more but we were paying like a thousand fifty bucks for that apartment. My dad was working minimum wage, and literally his take-home salary after deductions was like a thousand bucks. And my mom was working part time, and that part time income was paying for like, you know, food, you know, anything else. My dad's income was a bit more, but that paid for the gas and the insurance of the car and the rent. So like, his income was just to pay the bills, right? Yeah. And that was the first couple of years in Canada and the reason I bring this up and the reason it stuck with me was like that was the bigger shift along with sort of the culture shock it's like we were doing okay and now it's like we're barely getting by if you want to take this story a little bit deeper there were a few times where my dad lost his job so you, you can imagine spending everything you earn and now you <laughs> don't have an income and you don't have an income there were a couple of those moments because we moved here in 2008 Right. Okay. So you can imagine trying to find a job in 2008. So anyway, that was the first couple of years. And I think just seeing that, it, that was in my early teenage years. And yeah. I think it just cemented the something in my mind that like, I want my life to be different from this. Yeah. I didn't have it, you know, great examples of like what people doing well look like, but I was like, this seems terrible 
compared to what we were doing in Sri Lanka. Yeah. Like this is a step down and I'm like... We moved here for winter and a worse quality of life. <laughs> what were we doing? <laughs> kind of, kind of, right? So I think that just from an early age, it got me thinking about making money, like being resourceful, looking for opportunity. I would say that that's maybe the key one, like just look And you were even doing that as a young age. I think you remember you uh, telling me a story about how you started playing hockey or something yeah. like that. So first couple of years, I take on uh, ice skating, right? It was like a school activity and then did it once, kind of got hooked, got my own skates and started to skate. And then I, I told my dad, I want to go play ice hockey. My dad's like, literally, we can't afford it. But what you can do is go door to door selling trinkets to make up the money for <laughs> your ice hockey equipment. And I did that, right? So over the course of a couple of weeks, I sold over $500 worth of trinkets. That's amazing. And it was tough, man. Like, How much were these trinkets costing per piece? Between like five to 20 bucks a piece. Okay. So yeah, it was like, so if you think about the journey of an entrepreneur, yeah. that was my first foray into it. And then my mom was like, Oh, there's a, she was working at a restaurant. There was a restaurant nearby. The, the owners of that restaurant were the, the kids of the place she worked at. So she's like, yeah, they're hiring. I can put in a good word for you. So I got a job as a dishwasher. I was ecstatic by this idea that I just show up and I get paid. I don't have to get rejected over and over again, <laughs> trying to sell stuff door to door. I was like, fuck, this is, this is a step up. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> Go in the back of the kitchen and we're doing good. Yeah, <laughs> doing yeah. Good. I just show up and I get a hundred bucks for like five, six hours of work. Maybe like, steal a meal too. Like <laughs> They feed you at the end of your shift. Yeah. I was like, this is great. I mean, that that didn't last for long, but <laughs> for the first little bit, I was, I was ecstatic. So like the money I made selling stuff paid for my equipment. The money I made from the, uh, the job paid for the, the first year's fee. Yeah. Right. And I kept doing that job for the next two years. Hated it by the end of it. I was like, when I grow up, I want to never work a job where I have to stand up because I had to stand up doing dishes. Yeah, yeah. So when I graduated high school, my only criteria for a job was it just has to be something I can do sitting down. I just don't want to be in a restaurant standing up. And <laughs> so that so, was my takeaway. <laughs> so throughout this, you've definitely learned from all of your experiences so far. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I guess. I guess it's building up, but yeah, so got that job, graduated high school. I think one of the pivotal times for me was in that sort of last year of high school. I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I got accepted at uh, the university. Okay. Uh, what were you trying to do? Was that like a th something you wanted to do or kind of just trying to please your parents or? You know, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And initially I wanted to do civil engineering. Okay. That was actually what my dad studied. And I thought, you know, I, I was kind of good at little architecture, drawing stuff. I talked to someone in civil engineering, someone that sort of, uh, you know, my family knew their family or something, right? Yeah. I was like, you know, how's the job? And she's like, if you want to make a lot of money, this is not for you. You will work extremely hard and you probably won't make much money. Really? And that was the worst advice to give me because I was like, okay, I don't think I want to do this anymore. This sounds like it's terrible. Don't normally correlate engineering <laughs> with a poor wage either, at least in this, at least in Canada. <laughs> Yeah, but I've heard different stories yeah. about it, right? Like, anyways, so then I was like, okay, if I'm not doing that, what do I do? And, you know, I was good at sort of the business class in high school. I was like, okay, maybe business has something in my future. So I applied for like uh, business administration uh, programs, okay. right? So the one I got into was at uh, UTM, uh, University of Toronto in Mississauga. And yeah, so they accepted me. Initially, I was like, okay, so I'll go to this program, but let me take a gap year, right? I want to work a little bit, save some money. And uh, yeah, during that first year, I uh, I got into real estate. Really? Well, the, the way it worked was when I got accepted at the university, I went to the campus uh, to do the, the tour. Campus tour, yeah, yeah, campus yeah tour, of course. Right? Yeah. So they show you the residence and they're like, yeah, you'll pay 800 bucks a month to live in one of these rooms. And you have to pay another 400 bucks a month for food. I was like, that's a lot of money. And then just, I didn't, know anything but it just sparked the idea of okay can i live off campus and rent for cheaper and not pay this food and second idea can i buy a place with multiple bedrooms where i'm charging other people 
want to live there and avoid paying this 800 and 400 mm -hmm. to just pay for a room and can I stay in one of the rooms while I rent the rest out so just sparked an idea started googling it found you know uh, a group of investors that were kind of doing real estate investing in Ontario okay joined them learned from them and at this point I decided okay let me take a gap year to try to do this and I also spoke to my family, spoke to my brother, he was like, this sounds great, let's do it. Spoke to my parents who, again, had never owned a property in Sri Lanka. We were renting places in Canada, right? but you know, they were, my dad was Sri Lankan and mm. owning real estate is like a cultural thing for Sri Lanka. So like, you gotta own real estate, right? So when I told him this idea of like, hey, can we partner together, buy a place outside of Toronto, the core at least, right? Look in places like Barrie and Cambridge, and buy single family homes that we could rent out, we could own real estate, and by doing it together, we could sort of get in the game. Right? Yeah. What year would this have been, just approximately? Uh, this would have been 2012, 2012, okay. 2013. Okay. Gotcha, so gotcha. that was my final year of high school. I was already having these conversations before I graduated from high school. Uh, we were shopping for homes over the summer and we closed on the first home together by November. I had turned 18 on October. And <laughs> we, wow. Uh, so at this time, your dad's still working minimum wage? You know, they progressed a little bit. So okay. my dad worked at minimum wage until he got like a security job. Okay. And then it was still, it started at minimum wage, but then you, you get promoted you to work different your way yeah, locations. Yeah. So nothing crazy. I think he, like he was making me like 30 grand a year. So 30, that's minimum wage now, but back then that was above minimum wage, right. right? And I think by that point, my mom had got a full-time job. So she switched from working at the restaurant to a food broker. Okay. Uh, so they were selling fish to sort of the sushi restaurants. Nice. Uh, so at that point, it was a big step up for her. I think she was making a little bit more at that point. So like family starts time. making a little bit more yep. money, income's coping and says, let's take all your extra income and let's go buy a house. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So pretty much their life savings was the down payment of this wow. first rental property. And uh, we even looped my sister in there, her savings also went into, we actually somehow stretched it to buy two properties. Uh, so we bought the, like a townhouse in Barrie for 240,000. A townhouse in Barrie. townhouse, yeah. What do you just just for fun here? What do you think that's worth today? So at the peak, it went up as high as nine hundred, but we sold it prior to that, and I think now it's probably in the six to seven hundred range. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good ROI. Well, we sold it for four hundred. Okay. <laughs> so we made money, but not not yeah. that much money. But we, yeah, we bought that one in twenty thirteen, uh, which is over ten years ago now. So yeah, crazy how time has flown. And then you bought another one right with it, or how did uh, that like how did that work? May. So about six months later, we bought the second one. Okay. This was a semi in Cambridge. Was this always the plan was to like, because initially you were saying, you know, go to school, get a place. Then it was like, okay, we're going to place in Barrie. Did you, were you switching schools or did this kind of just evolve? Or how did we, how did we get here? So actually my plan was to take a year off, save up the money that I can use as a down payment to yep. buy that house that I was going to live in one bedroom, rent out the rest. So I was still in that one year plan. Okay. Obviously we took a lot more action than I was expecting. <laughs> we bought this first place, bought a second place. And between those first two homes, I was kind of deciding, you know what? At that point I had talked to a few people either in the real estate industry or just investors who like people that now I saw an example of like someone who was doing well in life, right? right? They were yes. making a good amount of money. They mm -hmm. had investments. And the conversations with all of them was like, yeah, you go to university, that's not going to move the needle for you mm -hmm. if this is what you're trying to do, which is like, you know, save money, invest in real estate, create a, like go into business, not necessarily work in a business, but like if you're, if you're going to be self-employed or start a business, you will learn more from like doing that. Real world experiences are supposed to be, right? Yeah. Exactly, right? So then at that time I thought, you know what, I don't yet fully know what I'm going to do, but I almost knew that this four-year business administration program was not what I wanted to do. Right. So it became clear that was not, but I didn't know the path <laughs> just yet. And I guess that segues into getting into real estate as a real estate agent. My example of someone in this industry was the realtor who helped us on those first two purchases. Okay, she's the same person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, she was great. She was an investor herself and she had 
I would say a mindset that it wasn't transactional. She was really trying to help us. You know, she would take the numerous calls that I made to her after we bought the home, kind of asking like, okay, we have a tenant uh, lined up. <laughs> what are we supposed to say? How are we supposed to get an application? What are we supposed to do? And she really like walked us through the process and was there for us. Nice. And then I was like, she's making a good income and she's providing value to us. Right. If I can make a good income providing value to others, like, like those are the two things I'm looking for. Like I, I wanted to do something where I got to contribute and like have a career yeah. and tied to it. I wanted a way to make a reasonable income. Like mm-hmm. I, somehow just, I think the way I'm wired, maybe going back to that childhood, I wasn't okay with working something that quote unquote I loved if it didn't have the potential to like make right. a decent income. Yeah, yeah. Right? fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, so around that time, I stopped. I decided not to go to university. I still remember I had to fill out this form and go in person to downtown Toronto, the, the campus, and like had the I choose to rescind my your application, <laughs> application or, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Right? That was funny. Kind of like a gym membership nowadays. You have to go in to cancel, <laughs> right? They really want you committed to canceling, right? I like that. Yeah, it was funny. They said like, yeah, we can't do this on the email. I'm like, I'm telling you, I'm not gonna come. <laughs> And you're telling me I have to come in person to tell you that I'm not going to come. come. But if I don't do that, like, what are you going to do to me? (laughs) Yeah, so at that time, I actually got a job at RBC. Okay. So now this first job I was working for the first year was with uh, this logistics company. It was great, actually. Started a minimum wage, but I was talking on the phone, talking to customers, sort of learning how to talk to people and, like, work with people. A little bit of sales in there. There was a... They had me cold calling a few people to try to get business but that wasn't my main job it was like if you have free time do this on the side i actually got like one or two customers from that which is like surprisingly good yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then that primed me to get this next job at rbc so my brother was working there he put in a good word i applied four times got rejected three times on the fourth time got in front of the hiring manager and i was like the anyways i don't know how well i did in the interview but at the end i i was like i did the key thing she was looking for which was I asked for the sales, so to speak. I was like, hey, so did I get the job, right? And I got the job, but I think that may have helped a lot because she was struggling getting the salespeople in this travel insurance department to ask for the sale at the end of the phone conversation. Right. So I was like, I just demonstrated to her that I can do what you're trying to get other people to do, Mm -hmm. which I think maybe made the difference. Because like my resume was like, no degree, one year of experience, like, not the it. ideal candidate. <laughs> that's it, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but it helped, I think, that my brother had done well in that department. For sure. So, so you got a little like, bit of that. Maybe it's in the genes. <laughs> yeah. So and you know, I, I think I did fairly well. I, I would say I wasn't the best, but I was within the top quarter, quartile. So I was always making more sales than whatever majority of the people. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it worked out for them. But as soon as I got that job, I started to think about okay, what's my next play here? Look for, you know options uh, within the company every job was like bachelor degree master's degree five years of work experience anything i was interested in right it it was all like in the investments phase or like i remember looking at all the jobs i was like fuck like there's i can't like i don't see a path i don't fit into this mold yeah like Like, yeah, yeah, yeah every path had like i would have to get three other jobs to get that job right or i just qualify no matter what mm-hmm. and then it brought back this idea about oh what about working in real estate so the first couple of years all my vacation time i spent going to real estate courses really right because one of the like i think the, the third test at that time was a three-week in-person test i was like i get three weeks of vacation in a year let me line this up so i took the three weeks off the exact same three weeks that course was there. I was living in Mississauga, driving to North York. Oh, wow. Every day back and forth. But yeah, that's, so I got my license while I was still working there. Yeah, that's that's kind of how I, how I got started. Awesome, that's great. So basically to sum it up, you came here, you went to high school, didn't really know what you want to do, decided that instead of, you know, going to university, let's just go buy real estate. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then got a, got into the travel insurance industry and then basically become a realtor. At this time, yep. you've still got just the two properties. While I was working at RBC, my brother and I, so we both were working there, we had the salaries to qualify. Right, okay. Uh, we then bought two more condos. Okay. Um, so how old are you at this point? I was 
20, 20, and 21 maybe. So by the way, I, working, the first job I was working, I was saving 75% of my income. So like, I was living at home, I was giving my parents like a hundred bucks of food. I was like, I'm saving every damn dollar I can. Yeah. Right? I don't know. I was I was a unique kid. I was like laser focused on this. Like, I want to get ahead. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to save but money. But not spending money is really going to help me. <laughs> 100%, man. Uh, now, when I went to RBC, I was saving less because I had a car at that point, car insurance. Like, You have more bills. I had more bills. Yeah. I was paying my parents a little bit because I was still living at home uh, at that point. So all those savings became my first down payment. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had about 20 grand saved up. My brother had 30. We bought the first place for about 250. Okay. Um, and I, I told him, I'll pay you back the other five <laughs> over the next couple of months. So that's the first one. And then the second one. So you bought it with 20% down then? Yeah. You didn't. You didn't uh... Well, it was a five bedroom student rental. So and you couldn't do less than 20. Tough to do a right? five. Okay. Okay. So you put 20% down on the. Uh on the student rental yeah so put 20 percent down on the student rental twice so both of these are condos in mississauga okay and the plan was to just pure investment so first one was pure investment just rent it out the second one at this point i was still living with my parents okay my brother was renting a place and we're like okay let's buy one of these live in two bedrooms rent out four and this property cash flowed while we were living in it because so the four bedrooms paid for the mortgage and for you two to live there. Yeah. That's awesome. 400 bucks of cash flow while we were living there. Like it was wild. That is wild. Now it wasn't the quality of place that you would want to live in now, but it was like- Helps uh, you get ahead. That, it, was, that was what you were focused I, on, I was right? 21 living with my parents to now like living in our quote unquote own place. I have my own bedroom and like, we own the place and if we you, don't. If you were in college and you were 21, you'd probably be living in similar living conditions. 100%. Right? 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, so. was, that was my mindset, right? And, and our roommates were students because they were all university students going to UTM. So that was the second place that my brother and I bought. And I actually just recently sold that a few weeks ago. Right. Um, so we bought the first one for 240, the second one for 268. Okay. In 2021, we kind of split the two properties. So he took one, I took the other. Yep. And I sold the one that I took, the one we bought for 268 was 680,000. Wow. Yeah. That is a really good return on investment. Crazy, crazy. In just uh, seven, seven years, I think, okay. since we bought it. I did do a renovation on it. So we put in probably around 50 grand, update the kitchen and made the place nicer, which helped on the sale actually. Oh, but, for sure. But yeah, just wild wild result. I wasn't expecting that when going into it. Yeah, I was when, like, when you bought that at 21, I, I don't think that was ever crossing your mind. Eh? I was like 400 bucks a month and I get a place to live. This is, I'm sold. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, to answer your question, those were the two properties we bought. And at that time, working on getting my license, once I got my license, I would, so that second home we bought, I was the one who actually helped okay. us purchase So it. that was, was that your first, that was my first deal? First deal. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh, and then at that time, we had some friends who were interested in partnering with us. So then we bought uh, two more homes in, this was 2017. So this was around the time I was working at RBC. I had my license. I was doing stuff on the side, helping other agents, doing showings, inspections, learning the okay. sort of- So were you like on a team then when you started or were you just working on your brokerage, just help people out? Or like, how was your experience of kind of starting as a real estate? Obviously you bought real estate first, so you had some knowledge of it. Yeah. But then now you're actually getting into the, you know, helping other people yeah. buy it. How did you kind of like learn your way through that? Like it's yeah. tough for, for people, right? hundred percent. So initially I, I was on a team, but I wasn't really on the team. I was there to help the other team members. I okay. kind of learn along the way. Uh, so they would just pay me per hour. I would do like showings for them, inspections, walkthroughs, anything that needed someone with a license to do. Right. And I would essentially buy back the time for the agent by them paying me to do it versus them having to do okay. it. Okay. And 2017, if you imagine, was a very busy time. That was one of those boom years, was, right? I, I don't know much about Toronto, but I know here in Niagara, that was when we saw like a huge yeah. kind of jump increase, yeah. right? That's when the boom started here. <laughs> yeah. Right? But the boom was happening in Hamilton and it got so crazy that people were coming to Niagara. Mm -hmm. So around that time, I also made the decision to move to Niagara because I was helping enough people do these showings in Hamilton, Niagara. And I was living in Mississauga, still in that condo that I own, just driving back and forth every time. And I just thought, you know what? 
a, a friend of my brother's actually owned a property on Centre Street in St. Catharines, so downtown okay. St. Catharines. Yes. That he was leaving vacant because he couldn't find a good tenant to live in. Maybe that should have set some red flags off. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I was like, I asked him like, yeah, what do you want if I were to rent it? And he, like, we agreed I'd pay a thousand bucks a month to rent a three bedroom house. Full house. And he was gonna put my rent towards improving the property. So he was gonna spend roughly 14 or 15,000 upfront, do the floors, windows, do all these upgrades for me to live there. Wow. It was it was okay. The home was broken into like twice while I lived there and it was definitely not an area I would want so to So you live now in. know why he had a hard time renting it out. Unbelievable, man. Like, I would never recommend someone to buy in that area. It was an experience that maybe taught you some good things. I don't know if a good experience well, may be the right way to put it, but it definitely probably opened your eyes to, you know, <laughs> a few things that are going on and probably what not only you didn't want to do, but maybe what your clients yeah. wouldn't want to do, right? Because well, obviously somebody advised this guy to buy that property. 100%. And and it, it taught me that, especially in these smaller cities, not in a Toronto, but like in a St. Catharines, there's areas that you don't want to buy in. And many times they're concentrated around the downtown, right? It's the older downtown area. Mm -hmm. And like, it matters. You you want to be in a good area. You don't want to go to a, a cheaper city and then go to the cheapest street. area in the cheaper yeah. city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you want to get the nice home in the nice neighborhood in the cheap city. Right. So you get that at a discount, but you then get good tenants. Yes. And you don't have the issues that, like, because look, you, you have a home that's broken into a few times, no good tenant's gonna stay. They're like, they're gonna move to a good neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. But, uh, and then you're stuck trying to find it. Anyways, that was his problem. He rented to me for two years. After that, I moved into a fourplex at that point that um, my family bought by refinancing the first two homes that we bought. Okay. We had enough equity at that point. We bought this fourplex. Okay, so you get this fourplex. This is now your fifth property that you have? So at this point, we had the first two homes that I bought with my family. Yep. Two more that I bought with my brother. Yep. Then two more that I bought with these partners. So oh, one, right. One right. was a duplex conversion in St. Catharines. One was a student rental in that condo building. So we're at six now. And then I refinanced the first two homes with my family to buy this as my seven. Okay. Uh, the fourplex. And yeah. you're how old? 2017, about 22, 22. Yeah. So before we get into the rest of your story, 12-year-old <laughs> Koken comes to Canada. Yeah. Did he think that in 10 years, seven properties was even like, like, was that even a possibility? Was that even a dream? Or was that like, you know what I'm saying here? Like, I think most most 15-year-olds or 20-year-olds right now, if you told them <laughs> they were going to have two properties, they would think that that's not even realistic. Like, you're an immigrant coming to Canada, living in a two-bedroom apartment, like, and now you got seven properties 10 years later. Like, is did that even cross his mind? Did you have those big kind of dreams and goals? Like, I'm going to go do this? Or like, was this just kind of a product of like, I'm just going to get ahead and however that happens, it happens. Like, Yeah, so 12-year-old Koken had different worries. <laughs> he wasn't even thinking about properties back then. Like, I didn't even think about this as an option when I was 18, right? I was just open to the opportunities. So... Right. You were driven, you knew you were gonna try and get ahead. You kind of had this, you know, big wide viewpoint of, yeah. okay, like I'll be open to how I do it. You kind of yeah. met somebody who was successful in real estate yeah. and uh, yeah, so like, just jumped in with I two was, feet. I was shown how I could help my family get these two rentals. So right. we did that. Through the process, I was like, oh, can me and my brother get rentals? Oh yeah, we can, okay, we got two more. And then now we had some friends who wanted to invest with us who had seen the first four. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, we'll do some with you more and at this point the first two properties had equity okay let's take that so like this wasn't some grand plan it was just like just can we buy a property yes okay let's do that just kind of kept leveraging the situation yeah. essentially right you, you leverage the first situation then you okay from there you could get another one then you people started seeing that you were successful yeah. so then you were leveraging that to kind of get people to partner with you and uh wow that's 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 pretty amazing <laughs> that's pretty amazing yeah, yeah. It, it didn't feel successful in the moment, though. I will say that. Really? Like, it's kind of interesting, don't you think? Yeah, I think I had maybe a, I don't know. So you say seven properties, and I'm like, yeah, but you know what? They're all partnerships. I only own a little piece of everything. That That's like the voice in my head, right? right. Like, yeah, you know, it is something, but it's 
it's not as good as what other people think it is. It's always sort of the conversation I have in my head. But that's probably a sign of someone who is doing a lot because they think they're not doing a lot, which is what pushes them to keep doing a lot. Keep doing a lot. Right. But yeah, that was my mindset through that time. And even that fourplex, that ended up being one of the best investments I think we've made. So I remember when you sold that. Right. And, and again, so that's a property. We bought it for 540. We Just, put about 120 okay. down. My parents didn't have 120. That was money coming from the first two properties. Right. So off the bat, this was a property that wouldn't exist in our lives yeah. if it wasn't for those first two investments. Mm -hmm. And then we did cash for keys. We got all the tenants out. I moved into one unit in order to get that tenant out. I lived there for two years, right? Once everyone moved out at the end, we renovated all four units and we sold it. And we sold this in December of 2021. So, so a pretty darn good time to sell a property. So definitely some luck involved there. But even then, it was tough to sell. At that price point, like we we got three offers on offer night, two of which had like crazy conditions, 60 days uh, conditional period, soil testing for environmental impact or whatever. Like, But then the third offer, and that, that offer came in because the agent viewed it on behalf of the client like an hour before offers were due. The client couldn't come, the agent saw it, he walked through it, it's like, I'm gonna get you an offer, okay, I will wait for you. Sends an offer, clean offer, no conditions. Firm, firm, 1.325 million. So, like that, again, you don't need too many of those to make these like, yeah, you make 800 grand in a couple of years, it, yeah. it's, it works. <laughs> so Now, were you looking, like, let's just kind of go back to that deal a little bit here, because obviously, you know, were you looking for a fourplex? Were you looking to kind of get into something that was like, okay, I've done a do, it sounded like you had a duplex conversion, you've done some student rentals. Were you looking to get into like that next kind of asset class? Or was this just, you know, you were looking for another cash flowing property and this one fell in your lap? Or how did you kind of get there? I think at that point, I was just always looking for properties. Well, I guess as you're being a realtor. Being so, a realtor. And you were an, an, mostly an investment realtor too. If I remember that right yeah, or no? Yeah, 100%. Like, I think I didn't work with someone to buy their own home for the first couple of years. Okay. So it was just purely investment. That property, I want to say this was in 2018. So this was during my first year of being a realtor. Okay. Probably closer to the end of the year. Came across this property. This was sitting on the market for about two months. And... Yeah, you know, we refinanced our two properties. We had the cash. So do you think you had some sort of maybe an advantage there? Like I was property sitting on it for a couple months. You then come in, do you see something that other people don't see in this property? Do you have a, a situation that allows you to kind of see value other people don't? Or why do you think like, you know, obviously you bought it. It turned out to be one of the probably the best properties you've ever bought, but it was sitting on the market for two months beforehand. So how did you kind of see past that, I guess? So I think it was slow because buyers had kind of paused. Right. This was tenant occupied. The guy who was selling it to us bought it for 480, like earlier in 2017. Whoa. So we paid more to him for a property that he bought at when the market was more active at a cheaper price. So if you talk about seeing value, there's a lot of psychological barriers to do that, to pay someone more at a slower time. Absolutely. And maybe this was us being naive, but I, I just, I ran the numbers based on this with the under market rent, after our fixed costs, we were cash flowing five, six hundred bucks. And I was like, if we get one tenant out because I'm moving there and I pay the same rent to this fourplex that I was paying to that single family home I was living in, right. we're bumping up our cash flow by a couple hundred bucks. If we optimize this building, we're going to be like north of two grand a month. So like that was there's, analysis. Yeah, and there's some, <laughs> I guess, work there that, as you know, we've found out over the years that you know, dealing with tenants and kind of getting people who are paying under market rent out isn't always the uh, yeah. I didn't know how to do it at all. <laughs> but <laughs> I had no but idea. But I did. we we got a bonus there as soon as we bought it. The first one of the tenants asked to move up oh. within a month, so we were able to get that unit up. I think two hundred bucks. Okay. And then yeah, over the next couple of years, I moved in. Then prior to. We didn't even get the tenants out while we owned it. It was at the end of the ownership as we were preparing to sell it 
that's when we started going to all the tenants and being like, hey, we'll pay you five grand. Can you move out? Do a little cash for keys yeah. scenario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we let them live there for as long as we owned it for close to five years, right? Yeah. And only at the end did we tell them like, look, you're paying on the market rent. In order for a buyer to pay the market value, like they're not going to do it if, yeah. if you're here. Yeah, you're paying on the market rent. So Absolutely. either we sell it and they try to kick you out or we give you some cash and we get to sell it, right? Yeah. So. And you know it went fairly smoothly with with all of them so it's yeah. good that's awesome <laughs> wow so now okay you're here you're in st catharines we've got the fourplex yep you're living in it and so this would be a 20 at the end of 2017 you're saying yeah so mid 2017 is when i'm oh, now so are you st you've now stopped working at rbc yeah started to stop that in the middle of 2017 or uh, how was that i October, guess October. okay so we're kind of in that time so how did that i guess transition go i know like when i personally like you know left my security blanket of a job and went full force into into real estate it was a, a very scary time and you know there's things going on that kind of prompted me to do that how yeah. did you make that jump <laughs> so uh, I had moved to St. Catharines before quitting, Prior, yep. right? So I was working from home at this RBC job. I had my license at this point. I had already started to help other agents with showings and stuff. So I was making a bit of side income from that. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I just quit cold turkey. I didn't have a single client ready to buy. No. Didn't have a single client ready to buy. This is one of those old ones like, you know, buy the car and you'll figure out how to make the money kind of thing? I guess, yeah. <laughs> Either that or I was lucky, but I around this time I was like, look, if I want to do this, I need to do this. My expenses were fairly low because, you know, I was renting this house for a grand. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, not spending that much. I had a old used car, but I had no payments, right? So, um, and I think I had like maybe five grand in savings. And I was like, this will last a couple of months. <laughs> and let me, let me see what I can do. <laughs> Uh, and, and yeah, like I think when your back's against a wall, you start figuring things out and like it can I, be it can be very motivating to be in a crisis situation, right? Or to be in a situation where it's like, I got no other way out. I got to I got to dig my way out, right? The scariest thing I will say is after quitting, I remember these days clearly. I had these days of I don't know what to do. I have free time, but I can't relax because not making money <laughs> like what do i spend my time on mm -hmm. and i think looking back that's kind of the one area i could have done better which was to have like a almost like a schedule or a workflow that like once i had all this time freed up by quitting this job to know what work i was going to do who i was right. going to reach out to call or like how i was going to move this forward but yeah somehow i figured it out i I was making YouTube videos. I was, I was helping these other agents. One of them started to send me some clients. That became the first. So now you're now working for, like you know, hourly wage. Yeah. Somebody paying you to do this. Somebody's now okay. Sending you a client, you probably got to pay him a fee or something like yep. that. Yep. But then you can at least work with the client, That's start right. to finish the transaction, yeah. get to being like a real realtor, yeah. so to speak. Right. And one of my pet peeves from the previous job was I was selling double of the most of the people on the team on average. Okay. But I was getting the same salary and I was getting almost the same bonus at the end of the year. Maybe they would get three grand, I would get three and a half grand. And I was like, but I'm selling double. Like, yeah, it doesn't seem equitable. Right, can I get paid for performance? Mm -hmm. And then it's like, real estate now is you're like- you're only getting paid for performance. <laughs> so I learned quickly, you know, that pendulum swings both ways, right? Like, <laughs> but I think it is what I wanted. I wanted to be, compensated for the work that I did so that I could work hard. Yeah. Right. And I just, it, it was what I wanted, even though it was tough. It seems like you've done this like full spectrum swing a couple times here. You went from selling, selling trinkets <laughs> to, oh gosh, no, give me a stable income to, oh gosh, no, <laughs> I need to do something different. And now we're all the way back to the, uh, the full entrepreneur uh, realm again. That's... Yeah. Well, I think I, I went as far as I think I could have in the career path, like the typical job. Right. I think a job at RBC, like most of the people who joined were, had, you know, university degrees. Right. This was their first job out of university. Mm -hmm. And I could see them having a path ahead. They had a little like, more of a runway. Yeah. Within the company, right? And I was like, you know, I'm doing well at this job, but I didn't see that being the clear, it's going to help me get ahead in this path. Mm -hmm. 
I don't like to be at a disadvantage in the things that I do. And knowing that this university degree not being in my face, like not having a university degree was always going to hold me back in this path. Yeah. It didn't feel like a situation I wanted to stay in. Right. And if, and if I saw like I was doing well in sales, if I can switch to a different type of sales, and if I can work hard and do well and I get, and that was going to determine my success, not someone looking at a resume and saying like, you know, you don't have this qualification, we'll give you a shot. I'd rather the client gave me a shot. Right. Because they saw that I could actually help them. Because mm -hmm. even this job at the RBC, the hiring manager gave me a shot because she saw I could do what she wanted. Right. I was solving a problem for her. Yep. Right. And I was like, if I can be in more of those situations in front of a client that they saw I was going to help solve a problem for them and they choose me. Mm -hmm. And instead of one employer, I would have 30 to 50 clients. I was like, that's exactly what I want. And then, you know, 10 people will say no to me because you don't have a degree. But then the 50 that say yes, I'll do a damn good job helping them. And like, that's what counts. Right. I don't need to make everyone happy. Right. right? right, so. right, right. Okay. So you're now getting clients. You're starting to work. You're still kind of on this team, not on this team though. Working yeah, here, I here end up full time. Yeah. I end up joining that team. It was good from a learning experience. I kind of just see how a team structure worked. Okay. It didn't really look, result in me doing too many deals. They did send me a couple of leads. Didn't really tell me what to do with those leads, but you know, I just called every single one, booked appointments, tried to move them forward. And, and a few of them ended up closing, but I think, you know, after a certain amount of time, I just realized, you know, I was spending a lot of time here. I wasn't getting the results I wanted. And there were just a few things that didn't really click with me as this is a place I want to stay long term. Right. So at that point, I made the decision, you know, let me go out on my own. Let me try to figure this out. Again, big step because I didn't really have a source of clients at that point. I was just getting like a few referrals here and there. Right. My YouTube channel had given me zero clients at this point. I was making videos, okay, but just getting no clients from it. Getting any views on the videos? Yeah. Okay. The, so the videos were getting watched, no editing, no quality, me with the cell phone talking, that was it. But you know, car audio is pretty good, right? So Car audio is pretty good. <laughs> yeah, and I just plugged away at that. 